Hi, I'm Ms. Tyler, and welcome to Context for Kids, New Testament Backgrounds, Episode 8, and this is also Hanukkah, Part 4. I call it the Maccabean Revolt, Part 4. It's only kind of right, because, well, we're still in the revolt. The war actually goes on for quite a while longer, but we're going to come to the end of this little series because we're going to actually talk about the first Hanukkah, which is what I've spent all these weeks preparing for, because, of course, Hanukkah starts um, this Saturday night, and I'm very excited, got our dreidels out, and our, all of our, and you know, you, you can't do anything without, without jelly donuts, right? Because they're in the Bible, right? No, no, but they're delicious. What are you going to do? Actually, you know, I take mine, Bavarian cream filled donuts, because if I'm going to do a donut, that is what I do. All right, so the, this week is, how do you cleanse the temple and that's a really good question because you know in the beginning you weren't supposed to have to do those kind of things the temple was never supposed to be defiled it wasn't like um, you know in the Bible God said well if you defile the temple it's like, don't defile the temple but they had procedures that they went through oh, we're gonna talk about that today we're gonna talk about the first Hanukkah might be two teachings we're gonna see how long this goes and we're gonna see how much I babble on all right, so, helps if you turn it on. All right, so, <laughs> Judah Maccabeus and his brothers had a dilemma, okay? So, after three years, almost three years of fighting at this point, they come into Jerusalem, okay? They've beaten down the enemies, but they've been living like, Wild animals, they even called themselves in the, in, the, in the wilderness, for three years fighting guerrilla warfare against the Seleucid army and against the Gentile nations all around them and against the Hellenized Jews, Hellenized Jews, which of course, as we remember, are the real villains because hadn't been for those meddling Hellenized Jews, Antiochus Piphanes would have just stayed home or just attacked Ant uh, Ptolemy. Ah, people who want to wear togas. What are you going to do? All right, so, like I said, Judah and his brothers had a dilemma. They come into Jerusalem after three years of the Gentiles just trampling all over it, and they look, and there's an altar on every street corner. There are high places. There are, um, they go up to the temple. The doors have been taken down. Some of them have been burned. Um... And um, the, the courtyard is completely overgrown with weeds. And there are terrible things. Of course, there's, there's terrible things on the altar and in the holy place. So, you know, they have to consecrate. They have to re-consecrate the temple. They've got things they've got to do. They've got an altar where the actual stones have been defiled. And so it's not like... Um, piece of metal where you can just melt it back down and remake it again and, and, and purify it. Well, those are rocks. What do you do when an altar has been destroyed? Well, we're going to take a look. We're going to take a look at Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, in 2 Chronicles 29. And I hope that you guys will kind of read through these because I'm going to give you three sections of scripture that are very important to understand about what is done when an altar is consecrated and dedicated. Now, Hezekiah's father Ahaz was a terrible king. As a matter of fact, he was so bad that they didn't even bury him in the family tomb. Whoa. And that's major disrespect. Anyone now who has read Honor and Shame in the Bible is going, Whoa! Yeah. Yeah, that's about as bad as it gets when they don't bury you in the family tomb. It's like, we don't like this guy so much, we don't even want to be dead with him. No. Okay, so, now, the Levites had to consecrate themselves. They had to consecrate, so they could consecrate the house of God. So what had happened to the temple? We're talking about Solomon's temple here. This is before the Babylonians destroyed it in 586. This is during the reign of Hezekiah, which was several generations before. So Ahaz, King Ahaz, defiled the temple of God. He was a worshiper of the Baalim. That's just a generic term. It's kind of like the word 
Elohim. Elohim can mean our Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God, or it can mean mighty ones, because it's also a plural word. Okay, so you can make Elohim mean mighty men or false gods, or it's and Baalim is what those Baalim means, master or lord. Okay, and it has secular uses, but it also has a pagan connotation when it's applied to making um, false gods your masters. Okay, so um, he made metal images. Okay, and worship them. He it says yeah you know, it says in um, Second Chronicles twenty eight that he offered his sons by fire, and there's a lot of debate about what that means because. They haven't found evidence archaeologically of child sacrifice. And so some, like if you read the mission up, they're wondering if it actually meant some kind of a dedication where a child was passed through the fire to be dedicated to a false god. Because the archaeology, you know, it's in, and the wording could go either way. But that's okay. Still, it's a terrible thing to do. I mean, it's not as bad as toasting your kids in the fire. But it's not good either. Very bad. Okay, he, he sacrificed to the Assyrian gods. And the reason he sacrificed to the Assyrian gods is the Assyrians had conquered their land. You know, so they were conquering their cities, and he says, oh, well, the Assyrian gods were powerful than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'll sacrifice to him. Bad idea. Oh, my gosh. He gave away the temple treasures that belonged to God. And he shut the doors to the temple. That means he shut the doors to, you know, so that nobody could worship God in his house. No one could offer sacrifices to him. No one could offer the incense. No one could light the menorah. Menorah went and lit. No one could present the showbread. And so what happens when things like this happen? Well, all of a sudden the priests aren't consecrated anymore. The Levites aren't consecrated anymore. You know, enough time goes by and they don't have anyone who can do the temple services. All right. Fortunately, the dude did not live forever. Okay, now, but his son, Hezekiah, was an incredibly righteous king. And, you know, he is one of those, there are different people in the scriptures where the ancient sages said, aha, there's a picture of Messiah. Hezekiah is one of them. So, what did, I say, what, WWHD, what would Hezekiah do? Since he's a picture of the Messiah. Ah, get it. Okay. <laughs> If you don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so he opened and repaired the doors to the Azara, which I spelled wrong. Get rid of that N right there. Mm. Okay, the Azara, that's all the gates around all the buildings that are around the temple, not the gates around the entire temple mount. There's an enclosure around the temple that has gates, has gate buildings. Those are the gates. So he repaired the doors to the Azara. The Levites consecrated themselves. We see this in verse 15. We saw open and repair the doors in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3. So I'm hoping you'll look at this later. And then in verse 16, it wasn't until they consecrated themselves that they could carry out the filth that was in the holy place. Now, what is the holy place? Well, if you watched um, episode 3, what is the temple and why is it so important? You know that the holy place was the place, wasn't the place with the Ark of the Covenant. It was the place with the menorah and the table of showbread and the altar of golden incense. Okay? So they had filth in there. Whether it was idols, whether, I don't know, I don't want to know. Whatever it was, it was not what God had wanted there. So it was wrong. It was filth. And in verse 16, it says, they opened up the temple itself. Is that They opened up the doors to the Ulam. The Ulam is the porch of the temple. It is the front of the temple building that leads the entrance hall that leads into the holy place. One day we're going to do all that stuff. i gotta make, I got to make diagrams. Okay, so we're going to read um, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 16 here. The priest went into the inner, and that's, Pnima, Pnima, that is a word that we see often associated with the altar of golden incense, Pnimi. 
and, and other things that are inside the holy place. Part of the house, uh, into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord. And the Levites carried it off to the brook of Kidron. Okay, now this is cool. The Kidron Valley. It's the valley that separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. And you've probably heard of the Mount of Olives because Yeshua, Jesus, spent a lot of time on the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples. But... But you need to know how funny this is because whatever filth they took out of their idols, whatever, they dumped it in the Kidron. The Kidron Valley is very interesting. You've got to know what's in the Kidron Valley. You see, Jerusalem, they didn't have outhouses. No. Human excrement, you know, poop, had to be carried out the alley. Kids are all laughing now, aren't you? Because I said that. Okay, I'm going to laugh too. Okay, so anyway, um, they took it out through the dung gate, dung gate, you know, and they dumped it in the Kidron Valley. So they just took all those idols and threw it on top of the poop. I'm talking like, what year is this? This is like 700 something, 600 something BCE. Man, there's like 500 years of poop down there. And they threw the idols on it. Sounds right to me. All right. So, next verse. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month. So this is Nisan in the spring. Okay, this is getting ready for the Passover season, but they're not going to be ready for the Passover. But that's another story. Okay, they began to consecrate on the first day of the first month, of he first month. Man, am I spelling today? And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule, the ulam, the porch, the entrance hall of the Lord. Then for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord. And the Hebrew for that is Beit yod Okay, the house of the Lord. So that's the actual temple building, not the buildings around it, the actual temple building. And on the 16th day of the first month, they finished. Now, the 16th day of the first month. If you know about the Passover, you know that that has to, do, that has to be done on the 14th day. So they've missed the Passover, but that's okay. Because in the Torah, it said that anyone who couldn't do it could do it in the second month instead, a month later. And that was a really nice thing to do because sometimes if somebody had a relative that died, they'd have corpse impurity that week. They couldn't go and keep the feast. Well, they want to keep the feast too. They want to honor God because the feasts were all about honoring God and celebrating his greatness. So they got to do it the next month. Well, this time the whole, you know what, this is not important to this story, is it? Man. All right, Hanukkah. All right. Hope you know, no one was wearing earphones when I did that. Okay, so... In verses 20 through 36, we see the actual rededication of the temple. We're not going to go through it all. Um, we see Hatat sacrifices, and we talked about Hatat last year when we did Vayikra, what were the sacrifices really about. Uh, the Levites sang and played instruments, and it says, according to David's, another spelling mistake, and the prophet's commandments. Well, David's and prophet's commandments, where do we get that? Well, if you saw the temple class, you know that that's in 1 Chronicles 28, verses 11, 12, and 19, where it said that David received all the plans for the temple and all the extra menorah and the tables, the extra tables, and all the extra stuff that the temple would need and the special temple services in writing by the hand of God. I don't know about you, but I have never received anything in writing by the hand of God before. But wouldn't that be cool? All right. So David and the prophets received commandments about how the temple services were supposed to be done. That is so cool. So that's what Hezekiah did. And the Levites sang and played instruments according to that. All the, the special temple things. All right. So the priest, the priest played silver trumpets and um, that's pronounced. I hope I'm not going to spit on the camera. Hats, <laughs> hats Those are the silver trumpets. That's not the shofar, the animal horns. You know, these are the long silver trumpets. They've made the new ones for the new temple, and they're going to build it. It's oh, so beautiful. Oh my gosh. 
Okay, they um, then they made Ola sacrifices. Remember, those are the whole burnt offerings. We talked about those in the feast offering class a few weeks ago. Okay, so Ola sacrifices while the Levites and priests sang and played instruments. You know, this tells us what was going on in the temple. So there, well, there wasn't really any details given in the Torah, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, about what they would do when the sacrifice were being given. This does. Okay? Uh, the assembly worshipped until the Ola offering was finished. Everyone bowed down and worshipped. And then everyone brought voluntary offerings. Okay. So cool. And those are Ola. They got all burned up. Those are all for God. It's like, God, this is all for you. Great big barbecue, and you are the only one who gets anything. All right. So, other altar and temple dedications that I would like you to look at with your family. Second Chronicles 7. Solomon inaugurates the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we look at verses 8 and 9 of chapter 7. At that time, Solomon held the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day they had held a solemn assembly because they had kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast for seven days. So first they had had to dedicate the altar, okay? That took seven days, just like we saw with Hezekiah over here. And then the feast for seven days. Of course, the Feast of Tabernacles it has, also has a, an eighth day tacked on the end of it. But, I mean, back here, it, um, yeah, for eight days they consecrated the house of the Lord, the 16th day of the month, first month they finished. So you've got, you've always got this seven days plus an extra day, seven days plus an extra day. It's really interesting when you do the consecrations and everything, like on the seven days you, you spend this, on the eighth day you can, bam, you know, do the next thing. All right. Da, 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 da. You really listen. You really want to hear me sing, don't you? No. Okay, Ezra 3. Rebuilding and dedication of the altar for the second temple again at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. So we're seeing a pattern here. When a new altar, see, because Hezekiah um, didn't make a new altar. Solomon did, and so did Ezra. Okay, so, at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, so we have a precedent for new altars being built at the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles being celebrated right afterwards. Okay, what did the Maccabeans do? Well, they were priests who were willing to die for God's word, so they did exactly what everybody had done in the past. Of course they would. They knew the, they knew the Bible. They reinstated the honor of God's temple and then celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles because they'd not been able to properly honor God at his appointed time. See, it wasn't the seventh month. It wasn't Tishri. It wasn't the time for the Feast of Tabernacles. All of the feasts for three years had gone. It had passed them. They hadn't gotten to celebrate. So now they, understanding that at the dedication of a new altar, God needs to be honored. They held a feast of dedication, like the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? wasn't actually the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a celebration where they gave God the same tributes and prayed the same prayers and worshipped Him with the same worship that He would have received at the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles, because they recognize that God still deserves our worship, whether or not there's a temple or not. That we still honor Him as we can. And so the first chance they got, doing that, doing those prayers, doing those sacrifices, because He deserved them. All right. And I'm going to read, you know what, it is 19 minutes, so I'm going to make a part two of this because I don't want this to take forever to load. Anyway, I am going to read that, and then we will... Maybe I'll show you what my family's doing for Hanukkah. Anyway. <sighs> well, that's it for a couple of minutes, but I'm just going to say it anyway. <gasps> I love you. I'm praying for you, and I pray you have a wonderful week studying the scriptures together as a family, because I always want that. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs>